Okay, so in this particular video, I would like to try and cover a few different things. Um, so it may go a little bit longer, but um, even then it won't cover enough, uh, to be fair. So right now I wanna talk about close reading, line, image, and a poem, all right? You have two poems for today, which is one is the William Stafford poem, Traveling Through the Dark, and one is Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, We Real Cool. I'm gonna talk about the William Stafford poem. Uh, in your response journal, we'll ask you to discuss one or the two of them, if not both. So. And I can use this, I think the best way to talk about close reading and line and image is to actually look at a poem so that we see this working in person. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that with you now. So the first thing to talk about real quickly is what is a close reading? What do I mean by that? If you'll notice on Moodle, there's a, a PDF up there called Breakdown of How to Read a Poem Closely. And it's a very step-by-step -step process about how to go through a poem and, and, and break it down to its component parts. So that's first and foremost. Make sure you have access to that one. You don't have to use that for every poem, but if you did do that for every poem, you would have a much deeper understanding of them, right? Just so that you can kind of see how we work towards analysis and work with that one. So a close reading of a poem is the same word, uh, it means the same thing as an analysis of poetry as, as we mean when we use the word explication. And the idea behind it is, is to go beyond the surface level of content and to try to understand you know, what the poem is about how it got to that and why it matters. So we look at things what we call poetics. We try to understand how has this been developed? How is the way it's presentation on the page and the way that it's been written, the construction of it, right? The artifice of it. How can we look at that closely to get a deeper understanding of the complications and the, and the layering of this particular poem? Um, it's a skill set, like any skill set. So it just takes practice as we do it. And one of the best ways to do it, of course, is to practice. Um, the, so I have the first week on the syllabus broken down into two different kinds of poetics, line and image. And I don't want you to think that these things are, um, you know, parts of an equation, right? It doesn't really work like that. They, they interact with one another, but sometimes it's nice to think about them separately. First thing I'm gonna talk about is line. Line is pretty simple in some ways, but it's, it's good to know the specificity of our language whenever I'm talking about this one. So first and foremost, this is a poem, okay? Um, this is the title, Traveling Through the Dark. This here, just this here, that's a line. I would call that line one, for instance. And then of course, this would be line two. Now. Line one and line two here, they form a sentence. So a sentence is different from a line. I know there's a sentence here because of the period that ends the second line. So this is of course again, line three and then line four, okay? Line three and line four again, make up the second sentence. This whole thing here from traveling down to dead, that's what we call a stanza. Right? It's important to know these words. So a stanza, it's a four line stanza, also known as a quatrain, but I'm not as interested in that right now. This is a four line stanza, is in and of itself its own unit. Stanza means little room, okay? So this is a, a component part of a poem. And because he's chosen to write these in stanzas, we have a, I don't want to call it a responsibility, but it gives us a place to think about why is it in stanza form? Why is it not written all together, right? When we think about line, again, this is a line, as, as is this one, different lines. We want to think about line uniformity. Are they all the same length? Do they vary? In this one, they vary a little bit, but they seem relatively close to one another. Granted, it seems like there's a few that are really short, like this one is the shortest one in the entire poem, and it would look like probably this one is the longest one. Now, does that mean anything? Well, we don't know yet, right? We can, we can make an argument for it, which is the goal. But um, the line in and of itself is an important part of poetry. It helps to really delineate it, not to use a, a, a bad pun, from prose, right? Prose doesn't use the line. Prose uh, paragraph forms, you know, they just, they fill up the page. <clears throat> Whereas in poetry, the white space, this here, negative space, right? The part where the poem isn't, is as important in, in many ways as the content of the poem itself, because it's allowing us to interact with the material in that space. So when I say line, I just want you to know for right now that this is what I mean, just a single line, and it does not mean the sentence. However, there are times when a line is also a sentence, such as this one, beside that mountain road, I hesitated. It's a complete sentence, it's also a line. So they can be interchangeable, but they're not always the same thing. And I want you to become specific with your language at the very beginning to make sure that you're getting these things correct. All right, so that's line. I'm happy to do follow up on this one, so please let me know if that didn't make sense. The second thing we're gonna look at, another close reading tactic, um, or we could use this in other words, another poetic, is, it, is an image, right? line and image. Line and image are two of the poet's strongest uh, tools, right? They're gonna use these in every poem that we read. Uh, they, are, they are 
integral to writing poetry. An image, though, to understand an image, um, there's a lot of examples that I could give, and it works better in a classroom setting, but to be brief, um, an image is something that that we can see, taste, touch, hear, or smell. In other words, they're sensory experiences, okay? So we're always looking for imagery inside of poetry, and poets are always using images to help us better understand what they're trying to convey, the sense of self they want us to hear. So over here, okay, we're gonna say that this over here is imagery. Now over here are what we're gonna call abstractions or ideas, okay? Abstractions or ideas are things that, that, that exist, of course, but they don't have a one-to-one -one correlation with, an, with a sensory experience. So for instance, I, I can say the word love, right? I can say the word love, and that isn't a tangible thing, okay? It's not, you can't just hold on to love. You can think about imagery that love creates. In fact, that's typically what we do. If I was to say, you know, what do you see um, or hear, right, or whatever, when I say the word love, okay, so over here, maybe you see one of these hearts, right? That's an image, okay? This is an image of a heart, not a traditional heart, but of a heart. And when we see one of these, right, if you see somebody, you know, uh, has written, you know, whatever, drawn one of those on your car window when you come out from class, um, then you know that that goes over here to this idea of love, right? They're, they're connected between the two. Um, but that's not the only image that we have for love, right? It's, it's specific to the person. In a lot of cases, um, we, can, we can find that to be specific. So, some of the time, a poem may not ever actually use this word over here. It may never use the word love, but it only gives us images. And the images will tell us and show us, actually, what it is that that person's trying to say about this idea, okay? Because love is different for every person. The example I always give about imagery, okay, over here on images, is the reason we want images is we want specificity because our language that we utilize with one another doesn't have a one-to-one -one correlation when it comes to, uh, to its meaning. In other words, the, the content I always say is a tree. Can you imagine a tree? I won't pause this, but if you <laughs> try to picture a tree, and uh, when you have a picture of this tree, right, you would share that with me, and, and, and I would ask, you know, what does your tree look like? And you would describe it however it is that you're going to describe it. Now, my tree, okay, is a willow tree. It's a willow tree. It's in Silverton, Texas. It's 1986. It's a very specific tree. It's a tree I grew up with, and it means the world to me, right? The tree is the thing that I grew up with. There's no way you saw the tree that I saw, right? Because you don't have my experience. You don't have my life. So there's no way I'm going to see the tree that you see. Some of you may have a specific tree like I do in a certain space in your life that meant something. For some of you, it might have just been like a sort of like a child's drawing, the Y tree that we all grew up trying to, uh, to figure out how to do. Um, and, and for some of you, it might be, you know, a palm tree, an evergreen tree, a Christmas tree that's well lit, a one, the tree that's on fire, a dead tree, right? The tree that's in Game of Thrones or whatever. It doesn't matter, but it matters very much, right? The idea is that even when I give you an image, a specific image like tree, you and I are not gonna see the same thing, all right? We're gonna immediately conjure it up into our own universe. So a poet's trying to make sure that we see exactly what it is that they want to show us. That's the power of an image, that we see that and that we know what they mean, therefore we communicate more clearly. Also, right, if we can't agree on what a tree is, how are we ever going to understand what the word love means, right? Because when I say love and you say love, we hear and see different things automatically, right? Given our life space, where we are generationally, um, who we are as people, right? The way we were raised, who raised us, um, what we enjoy, how we appreciate our lives, right? When I say love, I typically see like an image of my son, you know, my, my wife, our wedding day, right? But that wasn't always the case, right? At one point, it was like a cat. Like I really loved my cat. Um, and maybe for you right now, it's like a Cuban sandwich. Like there's nothing wrong with any of that. But the way that it's, that communication breaks down sometimes is that we assume that you're going to know what I mean when I say something. And poetry doesn't make that assumption. Right? Poetry is, is basically trying to show you very specifically the reality of this one single person. Okay? And in doing so, weirdly, we're actually able to connect a lot more than when somebody gives us just like generalities. Generalities don't help us connect. It just like forces us to have a bunch of different you know, convoluted images that we create. They give us the images and we from that extrapolate into an emotion. And typically it's not just one emotion like love, right? When we say love, there's also, also this issue of the simplicity of love when we know for a fact that there is no single emotion that's ever simple. You're never just in love, right? And you are, but it's filled with a ton of different emotional realities of fear. Uh, it's, it's always built into love. The fear of losing the one that you love. Jealousy um, is built into love as well. Frustration is built into love as well. Anger can be built into love as well, as can, you know, lust and, and, and 
And I guess I'll just end on that one because that's that's weird. But the idea is that is that it's just it's an idea. It, it has no single purpose. So we look for poetry for images to help us better understand it. William Stafford is a great poet to look at for both image and for line. So his poem here, Traveling Through the Dark, is going to be a lovely example of what we're trying to talk about. So that was a bit of an introduction to two different kinds of poetics, both line and image. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this one. And then in the next video, I will do a close reading that explains how we can look at this poem for its understanding of line and image and see if those two things help us better understand what he's trying to get at. So thank you very much. And um, I will see you, well, I don't know, maybe hopefully someday, right? That'd be cool. Hope you're good.